Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for coming. It's always a good thing to have to put out more chairs. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see so many of you uh, here. Um, most of you, I think, will know that we're um, quite a long way through now celebrating our 800th anniversary of the parish. It's been a, it's been a wonderful uh, run of events. I think there's over 25 events that we've uh, uh, put on, or there's a few left to go. Um, and uh, each of those have been very special in their own way, uh, connect with, connected with various uh, different people and organisations in our community. Uh, but we couldn't uh, celebrate uh, 800 years of this parish uh, without an event uh, dedicated to um, our most distinguished uh, uh, sort of forebear uh, who is uh, buried uh, in our historic church. Uh, that, in my opinion, is Thomas Traherne. Uh, okay, he was only in Teddington for probably two or three years, do we think? Um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he's ours. <laughs> we have his bones. <laughs> so we're claiming him. Um, and uh, it was in, um, I think, 2011 uh, that we uh, last put on a Traherne conference. Anybody came to that one? There's a few, yeah, so half of you uh, were there at that wonderful event. Um, you will perhaps remember the Bishop of London, uh, Richard Charters, uh, doing a talk there. I've, I dug out some copies of his talk, actually, if anybody's interested in them. Um, we were also addressed by uh, Denise Inge at that time. Uh, Denise was, uh, in many ways, the uh, leading uh, scholar of Traherne's theology, uh, a wonderful woman. Uh, who happened to be married to the Bishop of Worcester, but she was very much a theologian in her own right and a wonderful Traherne expert. Sadly, in the intervening years, uh, Denise uh, suffered with brain cancer and died in 2014. Um, and so there's a little bit of, of, of regret and sorrow that I, I think we would all feel about that naturally uh, but I'm delighted uh, that as it were uh, we have Denise's apprentice that's probably a, not a very fair way of introducing you Beth um, Beth the next generation of Traherne scholars um, and Beth you know knew Denise well um, and in fact, Denise, uh, she was just telling me how Denise um, bequeathed her papers to her. And, uh, and Beth, it's a great delight uh, to welcome you today uh, and uh, to hear a bit about your work on Traherne and especially uh, this theme of, of innocence. Um, and so in a moment, I'll, uh, I'll just hand over to you and maybe you could just introduce yourselves a bit more but uh, just um, just before we begin can I can I just say we are going to record uh, these talks um, and so it I think it, it would be good if we could just check our mobile phones aren't going to interrupt uh, the talk in any way uh, thank you very much for that Beth over to you and thank you very much for joining us today Beth Dodd please. Thank you so much for having me. Um, is that okay in terms of sound level? Wonderful. Was that a no? A little bit up. How's that? Okay. Um, so, yes, I'm Beth Dodd. I teach at Sarum College in Salisbury. Um, I train vicars and I teach in the area of doctrine and theology, arts and culture. And I've been making friends with Traherne for actually over a decade now. I uh, started off with my master's studies in Edinburgh and then decided to get a PhD out of him and then a couple of books. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to share him with you. For those, some of you will be familiar with Traherne, perhaps others a little less so. So thank you for inviting me to celebrate the life and work of this important, profound, but often overlooked 
spiritual writer. What I want to do over the next hour or so is to introduce Traherne to some of those of you who might be less familiar with him, and also to talk a little bit about what I think is one of Traherne's most important themes and his legacy for us today, which is Traherne's pursuit of innocence. So who was Thomas Traherne? He was born in the provinces, if you like, in Hereford, the son of a shoemaker in the English Welsh marches in 1637, which I think, from the perspective of Teddington here near the centre of London, pretty much on the edge of the world at the time. And he died pretty early on. He was only 37 when, as you know, he came to Teddington and he died possibly of smallpox. So he was born in rural isolation, if you like, but he died near the centre of English civilization, buried reputedly under the reading desk at the church on the 10th of October, 1674. And as some of you may know, that's the day that to this day Traherne is commemorated by the Anglican Church. So I hope you didn't forget it a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to explore a little bit about what brought this rural cleric to the heart of intellectual life near the great city of London. In his short life, words flowed out of Traherne like a river. And if you don't believe me, there are six very tightly printed volumes to prove it. But the abundance of Traherne's writing is matched only by the level of his obscurity. He was known only to a small circle of friends and intellectuals during his lifetime, and most of Traherne's works were never published. So he quickly became a lost poet. He was hidden in private libraries. He was drowned out by a cacophony of words in an age of printing. But in 1896, there were two unidentified handwritten manuscripts were bought from a book barrow along the river on London's south bank and handed to the bookseller Alexander Grosset. I don't know if you've ever been along the south bank and you can still see those outdoor booksellers. These were the last hope for unwanted books to be sold before they were discarded or pulped or burnt or turned into toilet paper. So this was the, a miraculous recovery, if you like. One of these manuscripts was full of poems and the other of meditations. Because Traherne was so little known at the time, it was initially thought that these were the works of Henry Vaughan, who was another mid-17th century poet from the Welsh marches. But it was with great excitement that Bertram Dobell, an antiquarian and a poet himself, identified these manuscripts as Traherne's and he published them as the Poetical Works and the Centuries of Meditations in 1903 and 1908. The initial reaction of the literary world to this rediscovery was hugely enthusiastic. Here was a new George Herbert, a new John Donne, a newly discovered poet who had been lost and now was found. And Traherne has since been an important influence on poets, on critics, on spiritual writers, artists and musicians, from Dorothy L. Sayers to Elizabeth Jennings, from C.S. Lewis to Thomas Merton, from Gerald Finzi to the stained glass artist Tom Denny. But reaction to Traherne has also been mixed and interest has waxed and waned over the years. Partly, I think, because Traherne is quite an idiosyncratic figure. He has an unbounding cheerfulness, which for some is curiously compelling, but others find it, in Traherne's own words, cloying or sickeningly sweet. It's interesting that Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, is going to be speaking to the Traherne Association next summer and I'm intrigued as to what he's going to say because as far as I've seen so far, he's not a particular fan of Traherne. 
But for those who do have a taste for his writing, Traherne is a wonderful teacher, and he is a teacher of the affections, of the emotions. What his writing does is induct the reader into an intense encounter with the divine, into the overflowing joy of knowing the goodness of God. So we have these two manuscripts. What do they contain? Well, if people know anything about Traherne, they probably know him as a kind of rural nature mystic, a poet of childhood, and a teacher of felicity. Traherne writes a little like a William Wordsworth or a William Blake about the joys of childhood and the wonder of childlike innocence. We're going to hear now from one of Traherne's poems of felicity, a poem called Innocence. This is part of a group of poems that occur at the beginning of his collection. And these poems are all about the experience of very early childhood, of infancy, right from the point of birth. So in the first poem, the salutation, the infant welcomes the world and describes the joy of encountering his body for the first time. In wonder, the infant glories in the world of treasures that he discovers when he awakes. In Eden, he sees himself as a little Adam in a sphere of joys, seeing childhood as a partial return to that Edenic state of Adam and Eve. And finally, in Innocence, Traherne describes the state of his soul in this Edenic paradise, a time of purity and delight. So we're going to hear now from Innocence. Uh, just one thing you need to know um, probably is the word antipast, which occurs in the final stanza, and an antipast means a foretaste or a foretelling. That which most I wonder at, which most I did esteem my bliss, which most I boast and ever shall enjoy, is that within I felt no stain nor spot of sin. No darkness then did overshade, but all within was pure and bright. No guilt did crush, nor fear invade, but all my soul was full of light. A joyful sense and purity is all I can remember. The very night to me was bright, twas summer in December. Whether it be that nature is so pure and custom only vicious, or that sure God did by miracle the guilt remove and make my soul to feel his love so early, or that twas one day wherein his happiness I found, whose strength and brightness so do ray that still it seemeth to surround. Whate'er it is, it is a light so endless unto me that I, a world of true delight, did then and to this day do see. That prospect was the gate of heaven. That day, the ancient light of Eden did convey into my soul. I was an Adam there, a little Adam in a sphere of joys. Oh, there my ravished sense was entertained in paradise and had a sight of innocence. All 
was beyond all bound and price. An antipast of heaven sure, I on the earth did reign. Within, without me, all was pure. I must become a child again. Thank you very much. One of Traherne's poems of felicity. And I think you heard in that beautiful reading a kind of easy nursery sing-song rhythm to those lines. A kind of childlike, what you call an iambic structure. No darkness then did overshade, but all within was pure and bright. There's a kind of childlike sense of safety and ease in these lines. Traherne describes his childhood as a state of innocence, with words like wonder, bliss, joy, joyful. This is a state of happiness. Innocence isn't just being not guilty in some divine law court. Innocence is a purity that is sensed, that's experienced, that's enjoyed within the inner self. He says, I felt no stain. A joyful sense is all I can remember. So there's all this imagery of light and warmth. But looking at this poem, there's also a shadow cast across it. Because the poet Traherne can't describe the light without the dark. All within is pure and bright, but only because there is no shade. The soul is full of light because there is no guilt or fear. Light and purity mean nothing without comparison with darkness and guilt. Traherne is describing the goodness of Eden, but to do that he needs to introduce a negative to say no stain, no spot, no guilt, no fear. There's a shadow there against which the light shines brighter. That shadow in the poem is the loss of that childhood state of innocence, because the voice that describes it is not itself innocent. This is not an innocent voice that is speaking. This is a voice that knows good and evil, that knows what darkness, guilt, and fear are, and which is struggling to describe a time before it knew all those things. And all it can do is catch a sense of it. I remembered feeling a warmth on the cheek. And this is where we're left at the end of the poem. We begin with wonder, but we end with a sense of anxious urgency. An antipast, a foretaste of heaven sure, I on the earth did reign. Within, without me, all was pure. I must become a child again. And in that final line, I must become a child again, that sing-song structure, that sing-song rhythm, takes on a stronger beat. It becomes more insistent. This is the goal of Traherne's life now that he has grown, to become a child again. I think we can read that line in two different ways. The first is a sort of yearning cry to return to the homeliness and safety of the womb. This world is just too harsh, too cold, too bitter. I want to return to a a world of light and warmth and peace. And anyone who knows their Freud or their Nietzsche knows that that's not a great thing to want, that desire to return to childhood, to escape back into the womb, to abdicate responsibility, not to take our place in the world as adults. So we could read this as a kind of desire to escape the world, but I think there's another way of hearing that cry, I must become a child again. And that's not about retreat, but perhaps more about advancing It's all about becoming again, being reborn, moving forward by recovering what is essential 
to human beings. And this, I think, is what is, Traherne is saying. And if you want proof, you can look at Traherne's meditations, his centuries, where he talks about Jesus saying that if you want to enter the, enter the kingdom of heaven, then you must become like a little child. And he says that this teaching of Jesus is something that is much deeper than is commonly apprehended. It's not just about retreating into infancy. This is about the peace and purity of all our souls. So what we hear in this poem is not a petulant complaint against the evils of the world. This is a statement of purpose, to restore what will equip him better for the trials of life and to enable him to enjoy the world as it is. And that's one of the most important features, I think, of Traherne's work, that innocence never leaves him completely. And one of the most powerful lines of the poem expresses that very well. What he's doing in this, those central stanzas is trying to understand the mystery of innocent. How innocence, how could it have been that he could live a life of such joy and peace and purity and happiness? And in the end, he decides he can't explain it, but there's that middle stanza there. Whatever it is, it is a light so endless unto me that I a world of true delight did then and to this day do see. Innocence is not stuck in Eden. It's not confined to that enclosed garden. It's not left behind like a childhood toy. This is a light whose beams break out beyond the horizon of infancy. A light whose strength is diffused throughout our lives, from cradle to school desk, to the sweat and toil of work through to final breath, even following us into the bliss of heaven. And that's what I'd like to do with the rest of this talk, is to trace a little bit of that light as it is diffused throughout Traherne's life and his poetry. But in the meantime, we haven't quite finished our story of Traherne yet, have we? We began in rural Herefordshire, Traherne, a child playing in the streets, running through cornfields and seeing the light and beauty of heaven in everything he saw, from trees to fields to insects to the dust of the street. But I mentioned shadows, and Traherne's, shadow, Traherne's childhood also had a shadow cast across it. For those of you who know already or who are observant and know their history, you might have noticed Traherne's dates, 1637 to 1674. The Civil War in Britain began with the Prayer Book Revolts of 1639. It broke out in earnest in 1642, and war stretched throughout the 1640s until the execution of Charles I in 1649, which then led to 11 years of a strict Puritan Commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell until the king returned in the guise of his son, Charles II, in 1660. These were years of turmoil, and they were also Traherne's formative years. Hereford was royalist, and so it went under siege from parliamentary forces several times during the 1640s. That's Traherne's childhood, under threat, under siege. He went to university in Oxford in the 1650s to study theology at Brasenose, which was a Puritan college, and that was his spiritual training ground. So Traherne knew plenty of conflict and suffering in his life, and curiously, you might say, none of this made its way explicitly into his works. He rarely refers to the Civil War. He's much more focused on encouraging his readers to strengthen the new settlement of harmony and unity in the Church of England. But there is a side of Traherne's work that it does engage with the darkness, the darkness of his times and the darkness of his own heart. And I think that's actually where Traherne's Puritan education comes in. There's this deep sense of his own weakness, 
of what he would understand as his sinfulness. And we see this trend in an earlier work of Traherne's, his Select Meditations. Now, this manuscript wasn't discovered until 1964, and it wasn't published until the 1980s. It's a collection of private meditations, poems, and prayers, probably written in the late 1650s, early 1660s. So this is around the time of Traherne's ordination and when he was moving back from Oxford to become rector of Credenhill near Hereford. This work in particular betrays that Puritan-style introspection, that sense of personal sin, but it also hints at the political turmoil of the time. We're going to hear from a poem called Thy Turtle Doves, O Lord, to Dragons Turn, from the Select Meditations. There's some strong Hebrew imagery in this uh, poem from the Hebrew Bible, owls and dragons, and there's also some kind of mystical Platonist imagery of light. And we're just going to hear a few verses from this poem. Turtle doves. Thy turtle doves, O Lord, to dragons turn. Lay waste thine heritage and make the world a cave, a cave wherein they mourn. Who should the glory of thy throne partake? Seas weep in briny tears, leaves tremble on the trees with fears, and stars do twinkle as if in all in doubt whether it be best to shine or else go out. The heavens fled, the earth is dead. Thy turtle doves to owls and dragons turn like doleful dragons in the wilderness. Surrounded all with poison, they blast thine abode and blessedness. That lovely queen of God in prisons lay. Green grass is parched, the flowers wither the heavens languish in their powers. The mountains are burnt up, the rivers dry. Tears only flow in rivers from mine eye. All these are fled. They dread, they dread. Those doleful dragons in the wilderness. His image in themselves laid in a grave. He's dead and buried. The treasure which they like dragons in them have unknowns unknown. They feel not any pleasure, but snuffle, snuffle up the wind and wallow in their filth, like adders blind, their skins like dragons clad with golden ore, shine brightly, overcast with greenish gore. Their scales display a poison day. His image in them's laid within a grave. Oh, from that from pomps, from balls and feigned pleasures, from poison splendor I might them recall. And from infected treasure, turning their skins into a diadem, to thee, O oh Lord, would I and thy goodness brighter than the sky in all the heavens shining them reclaim and show the glory of thy holy name. O Lord, revive and them retrieve from dragon's pomp, from foals and filthy pleasures. Then shall thy turtle dove again return. A filthy dragon no more be. Her face shall like an angel burn and she a cherub in her love to thee. Another glory then, in wholesome sort, shall deck the sons of men. No poisoned virtue, but the purest gold. I on thy turtle shell, with joy behold, angelic life throughout her skin, shall clad thy white and make her shine within. Thank you very much. 
In this poem, we hear the young pastor struggling to come to grips with his own propensity to sinfulness and expressing it in the strongest terms that he can find, doleful dragons, owls, dread. The symbolic images of the dove and the dragon are contrary emblems of the human heart, the dove in the state of holiness, the dragon in the state of corruption. For someone so reputedly cheerful, I think it's amazing how visceral Trahan's language is when he comes to reflect on the wastelands of human experience. Humanity is created in God's divine image, but seems to have murdered itself. His image in themselves, laid in a grave, is dead and buried. There's a finality to these verses which makes the fall into sin feel like the death of innocence. But I said that that light follows Trahan throughout his life, and I think we see even in poems like this those glimmers of light, of goodness brighter than the sky. Where on earth can innocence be found in the depths of human failure and despair? Even here the light shines, although hidden. In the first stanza, the stars continue to twinkle, although uncertainly, as if all in doubt. And it turns out that the image of God, though laid in a grave, is not completely destroyed. Traherne uses an ancient legend to describe this. There was a notion that dragons hid a jewel in the heart of their brain. So in the same way, the treasure which they, like dragons in them, have unknowns unknown. The light of innocence within, unbeknownst even to ourselves, is the buried treasure in the field. It's the pearl of great price. It's the jewel hidden in the dragon's brain, covered in scales. And so the glory of the human being remains even in our dragonish guise. The scaly skin of the dragon is golden, although besmirched. Their skins, like dragons clad with golden ore, shine brightly, overcast with greenish gore. In the Christian divine economy, death is followed by resurrection. So the apparent death of the image of God only makes the final resurrection all the more glorious as the grave is wonderfully confounded and God's image is restored. So in the final stanza, there's a sense of hope for redemption, for resurrection. The image of God will be restored in a kind of metamorphosis. The dragon will become a dove again and its true light will be revealed. Her face shall like an angel burn. Angel was one of Traherne's favorite epithets for human beings. We are all at heart angelic cherubim, creatures of light created to know and love God. And the light of the angelic human creature doesn't just shine out from their face, it irradiates their entire being. The jewel in the brain glows with a divine light that breaks out beyond the bounds of the body, breathing through bone and muscle, sinew and skin to illuminate the whole world. Angelic life throughout her skin shall clad thy wife and make her shine within. So we see the light of innocence glinting through, even in the darkest periods of life with the promise that one day it will shine forth. Whatever it is, it is a light so endless unto me that I a world of true delight did then and to this day do see. Let's continue with Traherne's story. He became well established as rector at Credenhill In the 1660s, a devoted priest with an admiring congregation by all accounts. He had a love of walking around the parish and talking to people about God, whether they wanted to listen or not. 
and from that he gets his reputation as a cheerful Anglican divine. But there was another side to Traherne. The cosmopolitan intellectual and even perhaps the career cleric. At the start I asked how it was that this rural priest ended up buried under the reading desk at Teddington near the centre of civilization. And I think it was that other side of Traherne that brought him here. He might have been a minister in rural Herefordshire, but he had studied at Oxford, and he continued to visit there throughout the 1660s, and he continued to study for his BD, which he got in 1669. Around the same time, although he might not have come here until a bit later, he became chaplain to Sir Orlando Bridgman, who was the keeper of the royal seal. Bridgman was soon to fall out of favour with the king, but for a long time he'd been an influential patron of young scholars and intellectuals of the Platonist persuasion like Traherne. So Traherne was the end of a long line of protégés. We might think that Traherne was largely unknown because his works were never published. But in fact, his handwritten manuscripts would have been passed round, annotated and critiqued by his circle of peers. And if you ever get the chance to look at them, in fact, you can find a lot of his manuscripts online now. You can see where some of his friends and teachers have written comments in the margins. So while Traherne might have been forgotten after his death, during his life, he did not live in obscurity. So perhaps we have a man here of two lives, rural cleric and nature mystic on the one hand, and part of a vibrant intellectual community, perhaps even climbing the clerical ladder on the other. One of the few works that was published around this time, just after his death in 1675, was Traherne's treatise on Christian ethics. It's a good example of his more mature thought, and what he's doing in this work is coming to terms with the attempt to lead a good life in the midst of trials and temptations. I think there's a knowingness to this text, there's a recognition of the struggles of life, but interestingly also a very firm commitment to focus on the good, that this book is all about virtue, Traherne's Christian ethics is not interested in vice or sin or temptation. It's all about the virtues. What does it mean to be a good person? The next poem that we're going to hear is all about what it means to seek goodness in an imperfect world. Virtue was easy in Eden when Adam and Eve were free from sinful thoughts, from temptation, from trial and suffering. But to be good, to be innocent here and now, is quite another matter. The opening line of the poem, as you'll see, is, were all the world a paradise of ease? You should read that as, if the world was a paradise of ease. There's a sense of longing in this poem, a sense of yearning and desire, but also a sense of frustration, that happiness might so easily have been within our grasp, but now we must fight to attain it. And we're all the world a paradise of ease. We're all the world a paradise of ease. T'were easier then to live in peace. Were all men wise? divine and innocent, just, holy, peaceful and content, kind, loving, true and always good, as in the golden age they stood. T'were easier then to live in all delight and glory, full of love, blessed as the angels are above. But we such principles must now attain, if we true blessedness would gain, as those are which will help to make us reign all disorders, injuries, 
ingratitudes, calamities, affronts, oppressions, slanders, wrongs, lies, angers, bitter tongues. The reach of malice must surmount and quell the very rage and power of hell. Thank you very much. I think it's fascinating in that poem, halfway through the tone seems to shift. I don't know if you notice. There is that kind of easy, that sense of beauty and order in the first half where all the world of paradise of ease. And then the second half is a lot kind of, it's a lot more broken up and it, it turns into this kind of flat tone, which I think is an expression of the if what Traherne is talking about, how the world has shifted and is not as beautiful or as easy as it once was. This world is not Eden where everything was there to be enjoyed, where happiness required no effort. Here we must struggle for felicity against the very rage and power of hell. Here the delights of Eden are not denied us altogether, but they are missed. They are yearned for, and they are hard fought for. For me, the most powerful line in that poem is that yearning cry, were all men wise, divine, and innocent. If only all people were wise, divine, and innocent, life would just be so much better. It's a phrase that occurs several times in Traherne's works, also in his Centuries of Meditations, and in another short, delightful treatise called Inducements to Retiredness, which is where Traherne is extolling the joys of meditation and private prayer. And one of the things that I could talk for a whole hour about is that phrase, wise and innocent. Traherne isn't just desiring innocence, he's desiring wisdom too. It's not just about wanting to be naive again, to no longer know good and evil. This is about being wise in the face of the world and good in spite of trials and temptations. For those of you who know their New Testament, Christ said, be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And that is the rallying cry of this poem. And I think of Traherne's ethics as a whole. And I think we hear there again a reiteration of that great desire, that great purpose, I must become a child again. Not as a retreat into the womb, but more like a glorious battle through which Traherne will grow in virtue, in strength, in grace, and in glory. Whate'er it is, it is a light so endless unto me that I a world of true delight did then and to this day do see. The pursuit of innocence, the drive to become a child again, is a lifelong struggle. And so the innocence of this life is not going to look the same as the easy innocence of Adam and Eve. What might it look like to lead an innocent life? in the face of misery, in the depths of trial, in the midst of temptation and suffering. This was one of the key themes of Traherne's theological treatise, The Kingdom of God. Now this manuscript wasn't discovered until 1997 in the Lambeth Palace Library, and it was only published for the first time a few years ago. The Kingdom of God is another one of Traherne's more mature works, and it ranges through heaven and earth, from atoms to the stars, explaining how all things are part of God's kingdom. In the final chapter, although this might not be the end of the work, it might well have been left unfinished, there's a reflection on the nature of this world as what Traherne calls an estate of trial. And he's reflecting on what it means to live in a state of trial, and what it means to be good in the midst of temptation and struggle. In the last poem, we had that key word, if. 
if all men were wise and innocent, with that kind of yearning sense of if only, if only all men were wise. The next poem that we're going to hear also has that key word, if, but now it's the sense of as if. The phrase as if in Traherne's writings is encouraging you to play pretend, to enter into the realm of imagination. What do you do when you're a child? You decide to act out a story as if you were a king or a queen who owns everything in sight, as if the pebbles in the street were precious jewels. You play along as if all things were created for your delight. Traherne was very good at playing pretend. In this poem from The Kingdom of God, Traherne is encouraging the reader to play, to imagine and to act as if they were in heaven. So this is for man to act as if his soul did see. For man to act as if his soul did see the very brightness of eternity. For man to act as if his love did burn above the spheres, even while in its urn. For man to act even in the wilderness, as if he did those sovereign joys possess, which do at once confirm, stir up, inflame, and perfect angels having not the same. It doth increase the value of his deeds. In this a man a seraphim exceeds. To act on obligations yet unknown, to act upon rewards as yet unshown, to keep commands whose beauties yet unseen, to cherish and retain a zeal between sleeping and waking, shows a constant care, and that a deeper love, a love so rare, that no eye service may with it compare. Thank you. I don't think it's the most lyrical of Traherne's poems, but I think there is a strength there and a maturity, and you get that sense of purpose as well. We've moved on in this poem from yearning and desire to intention and determination. Traherne isn't content to simply lament the loss of childhood, to yearn for an absent Eden. For anyone who knows Paradise Lost, in that work John Milton describes heaven and hell as a state of mind. And Traherne thinks something very similar. Through the power of vision, through the strength of will, he believes that human beings have not only the capacity, but also the vocation, the job, if you like, to create heaven here, to bring heaven to earth, to inaugurate the kingdom of God, to make a heaven of a hell. And the way that happens is through that key phrase, as if. If we want to bring heaven to earth, then we need to behave as if we were already there as if our souls were free to love each person infinitely, as if we were able to see in each individual the fullness of the image of Christ. Imagine what miracles we might perform if we were able to love and honour each person we met as if we saw them as an angel from heaven. No wonder people thought Traherne was just a little bit mad. No wonder they can find his exuberance just that bit too much. But Traherne isn't delusional. He's clear that this way of being is a playing pretend, to act even in the wilderness, as if he did those sovereign joys possess. But it's not just playing, is it? It's not just about childlike imagination. This is Traherne's ethical teaching his teaching, his training of the affections, 
based on the transformative power of vision. Mad or not, this is what makes humanity higher than the angels, having the power to do good in spite of evil through the force of our will and the vision of our imaginations. And that is what innocence might look like in this world of trial. That I, a world of true delight, did then and to this day do see. The last poem and the final one that we're going to finish with, I think give us an insight into the other facet of Traherne, his other side, and that's Traherne the mystic. As we still saw in the last poem, Traherne's mystical imaginings are much more than personal spiritual experiences. The most mystical passages of Traherne's works are also thoroughly pedagogical. What Traherne is always doing, I think, in his works is teaching. He's teaching the reader, he's training the affections, and he's trying to induct them into that vision, a vision of heaven that will, will transform them. Whatever else he was, poet, mystic, intellectual, controversialist, career cleric, he was also a priest. And as a priest, Traherne felt called both to model an innocent life and to exhort, to encourage others in it. The ordination service for the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, which is what Traherne would have used during, during most of his ministry, the ordination service contains the following prayer. So replenish them with the truth of thy doctrine and adorn them with innocency of life, that both by word and good example they may faithfully serve thee in this office. Adorn them with innocency of life, a high calling indeed. As a priest, Traherne had promised to pursue innocence. And there are all sorts of ways we can understand that, and perhaps at first glance, that might sound just like not doing anything wrong, avoiding evil, keeping your hands clean, keeping yourself away from sin. And all those kind of connotations attached to that phrase, I think, are fair enough. But for Traherne, what was his model for an innocent life? I don't think it was that kind of puritanical moralist who's just taking care to go through life skirting well clear of anything that might smack of sin. Nor do I think Traherne's model of an innocent life was Adam in Eden. Adam was free and happy, but also naive and inexperienced. When Traherne considered what it meant to lead an innocent life, I think he looked to the Jesus of the Gospels, who we've heard twice before already. If you want to enter the kingdom, come as a little child. Be wise as as doves, be wise as serpents, and innocent as doves. So Traherne looked to Jesus as a model for innocence, a Jesus who lived with loving exuberance, who went through the world treating sinners as if they were kings and queens, outcasts as if they were the most beloved. Someone who saw all things through the light of heaven and exhorted all he met to see and hear the kingdom of heaven is near. Now is the time to act as if all God's promises have been fulfilled. So the rapturous exuberance of Traherne's mystical style is an expression of his priestly ministry in imitation of and in obedience to the words of Christ. It's a knowing innocence, it's a wise innocence, mature in its understanding of human nature and of how far we have fallen from what we have the capacity to be. It's also a courageous innocence that chooses light over dark, despite difficulty, in the face of trial and temptation, and regardless of suffering and evil. 
So in the final poem, I want us to return to the poems of Felicity, and I'll let uh, this poem have the last word. It's often read as a poem about childhood because in that first line it begins sweet infancy and it seems to be talking about that cherubic, angelic state of the infant innocent. But I think this poem goes well beyond the childish musings of wonder, Eden and innocence. This is a poem about the glory of the human creature created in the image of God. It expresses the state of glory that Traherne was looking forward to, the state of glory that his ministry points to, whose beauty and joy all his writings are trying to convey. So, as I've been saying throughout, Traherne's vision of innocence doesn't just look back nostalgically to the comforting light and warmth of infant Eden, nor does it just look forward to the hope of heaven, Innocence pervades Traherne's poetry because it's about being fully human at whatever stage of life. The light of innocence shines in infancy and beams forth throughout the human life, sometimes dimmer, sometimes stronger, sometimes wavering and diffuse, sometimes buried or hidden. But innocence persists because innocence is the image of God within us, which we see most clearly in the face of Christ. It's a light that we bear, and which in the glory of heaven will burst forth in fire and in the fullness of joy and wonder. So to let Traherne have the last word, we have the rapture. Sweet infancy, O fire of heaven, O sacred light, how fair and bright, how great am I, whom all the world doth magnify. O heavenly joy, O great and sacred blessedness which I possess, so great a joy who did into my arms convey. From God above being sent, the heavens me enflame, to praise his name, the stars do move, the burning sun doth show his love. Oh, how divine am I, to all this sacred wealth, this life and health who raised, who mine did make the same, what hand divine. Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, talk, um, both uh, weaving in the poetry, which was much appreciated, and thank you very much to our Traherne group for reading it, but uh, thank you, Beth. I, in particular, I, I'm very grateful for the, um, as it were, the uh, uh, unpacking a bit and helping us appreciate this idea of a second innocence. Um, it was something that uh, I remember Bishop Richard sort of talking about at the end of his Uh, talk that he did uh, six years ago and thinking that to to me that was the most fascinating um, theme and but he left it hanging and what you've done is taken that and uh, explained you know how that works in Traherne's writings uh, how that is a second innocence and not a first uh, sort of naivety Um, and so I'm very grateful to you and uh, thank you very much Uh, we have um, before tea uh, just five minutes uh, of uh, opportunity for you to ask Beth any questions uh, following that talk. Yes. Can I just make an observation? The yes. Last line, mm. divine. Yes. The tiger. Yes. Uh, but they didn't know each other. No, and that's one of the amazing things. <laughs> yes. I mean, what they're both tapping into, that's the, tr- uh, the quote from William Blake's Tiger, Tiger Burning Bright. 
Um, both Traherne and Blake are tapping into this tradition of Platonic mysticism that runs throughout um, you know, Christian thought. So they're part of the same tradition, but yes, there's no way that Blake would have read Traherne, and I think that's one of the wonderful... It's yeah. It's Thank you. Yes, I think that's a really interesting comment because Traherne is often grouped together with the metaphysical poets, but he's probably more often likened to George Herbert than he is to John Donne, probably because they're both considered safer hands, um, both Herbert and Traherne. And Traherne does quote Herbert. Um, he has a poem on love, um, which has Eucharistic imagery quite similar to Herbert's Love Three. But I think that comparison with Dunn is actually quite helpful because it's the passion um, and that kind of avaricious desire for God that's a particularly strong theme in Traherne's work, uh, which perhaps does resonate a little with Dunn. I don't think he had quite so much darkness in his soul as Dunn did, but uh, <laughs> yes. Still got dragons. Yes, still got dragons and owls. Yes. Susan? We've often wondered what it was like in the Traherne reading group, um, what Traherne was actually in life as a person. Mm. Um, is there any insight anywhere from anybody who met him? Mm. Has anybody written anything about him? There's a few um, letters and things just from around the time, um, almost like, you know, commendations soon after Traherne had died, um, kind of eulogising him a little, if you like. So you can take a look in the, um, the Margoliouth edition of Traherne's Centuries. He's reproduced them just at the start. So that's the best that we know about Traherne, and that's where we get those stories of him tramping around the parishes and talking the hind leg off a donkey, that kind of thing. Um, yes, but there's not much. We don't have any of Traherne's letters, for example, or any letters to him. A man of words. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Quite a lot of them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beth. I think we'll, um, we'll brew up, if that's all right. Um, while we're doing that, though, just remain seated for a moment uh, while our um, cake team get, get in action, uh, because we'd just like to um, uh, play you a, uh, a piece um, that has been, uh, as it were, commissioned for today. Margaret, would you like to say a few words about it? Thank you very much. If you'd take the uh, lectern. Thank you. <coughs> It's very much part uh, of our wonderful 800 celebration, of course. We've been looking at Traherne and the works of Traherne and talking about the recordings and things we've done today. And um, our great um, musical director, Derek Saunders, has put to music one of probably one of the most popular and well-known um, poems of Traherne, Wonder. So uh, he has composed the music to what you're going to hear now, and the church choir have sung it. And this is, the, this is the first time it's actually been played in public, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you. How long does it last? Uh, it's only a few minutes. It's only a few minutes. But, it's only a few minutes. Pardon? Three minutes. Okay, so we'll let, we'll let it sit and, uh, yes. and then we can have tea afterwards. And we'll play it again.
Margaret and Fred for recording it. Thank you very much. Um, tea and cake, and we'll uh, we'll uh, be back on uh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>